All right, hello there. Uh, this is Hui Ling. I'm your instructor for Chem 110A. So since there were some technical issue, I wasn't able to record our lecture yesterday. So this is a makeup recording of our lecture one in case you want to review what we discussed about. Um, so we went over the syllabus in class together on Monday. So I highly recommend you read the syllabus. And just for your information, we have a syllabus quiz that is due this Friday. Um, you'll get four extra credit for answering the syllabus quiz questions correctly. All right, so let's jump into the materials we covered in lecture one on Monday. So we start our lecture by introducing what is thermodynamics and what kind of question are we aiming to answer by learning thermodynamics. So here is the general structure your textbook showed you. Depending on what kind of question we have, now we have either macroscopic question. So macroscopic question is talking about things that happening in our daily life, like you have a cup of water, you have mass, volume, temperature um, of the water, you know the pressure the water exerts, um, exert on the cup, right? So these are macroscopic properties we're talking about. Now, on the other hand, we have microscopic properties, like for example, atomic and molecular structures. So for microscopic properties, these are for quantum mechanics that you will cover later on in a different class. For this class, we are focusing on thermodynamics and we are focusing on macroscopic and equilibrium. Now, in between, we have statistical mechanics to link the microscopic world and the macroscopic world. So I have um, one or two lectures at the end of this quarter that we aim to cover a little bit of statistical mechanics, but the majority of this quarter's class will be focusing on thermodynamics. Now, what is thermodynamics? It, we just answered the first question, right? So what kind of question thermodynamic uh, will answer? Now, according to your textbook, we have the definition for thermodynamic. That's again, thermodynamics is the study of heat, work, energy, and the change they produce in the state of system. And again, in this sentence, we have lots of things that we need to define, right? So heat, work, so these we will discuss when we get to chapter two, and also energy when we talk about the first law of thermodynamics. But in this lecture, we will talk about definitions on terms of thermodynamic. Like for example, what is a system? So getting started on today's lecture, we have several terms in thermodynamics. So these are definitions of terminologies we will be using in thermodynamics. So we're constantly using these, thermo, thermo, uh, these thermodynamic terminologies in the rest of this quarter. So I highly recommend um, on top of listening to today's lecture that you'll be feel like, okay, I know what it is, right? So um, get familiar with these thermo, um, thermodynamic terminologies so you know what we're talking about. So the first pair we care about is, well, system and surroundings, right? So a system is a macroscopic part of the universe that is under study. Or the other way to put it is our universe is quite big and complicated. There are so many things happening all at once, right? So for us as scientists, whenever we're looking at a system, we're talking about, hey, this is the object or this is the part of the universe that we care about, that we are studying at the moment. So we are manually defining the system as a part of the universe we care about. Well, alternatively, Everything else in the universe that are interacting with the system, but not part of the system, are considered surroundings. So in this one, you want to pay attention to this word, saying like um, the part of the universe that can interact with the system is the surrounding. 
So when we're talking about system, there are different criteria we use to define system. For example, we have open system, telling it is a trans um it allows transfer of matter, and it allows transfer of energy. So a daily life exp um example would be you have say a cup of water where which um doesn't have a lid right so it's open to air the water can evaporate into the air so it is an open system it allows both transfer of matter and also transfer of energy. Alternatively, you can have a closed system. So these two difference. By talking about whether or not you have transfer of matter, so in the same example, now instead of having the lid open, we close the lid of that cup of water, and now you cannot allow transfer of matter from your system to the surrounding, but the cup itself is not isolated, right? The cup itself allows. Um, energy to pass through, or like for example, if you have a cup of hot water, now eventually if you put it in room temperature, the temperature will drop. So that temperature drop is the result of transfer of energy. So open and close tells you whether or not you have transfer of matter. Both of them allow transfer of energy. And then we have a third criteria, which is. Um. Well, we well. I guess it's a different dimension. This one talks about isolated versus non-isolated. So an isolated system tells you it allows no transfer of matter and no transfer of energy. So that's being isolated. So here I want to post a quick question. Now let's say we have a system one. That's isolated. Um and isolated to the that's isolated to the surrounding, and then you have a different system, and that's also isolated. So in this case, since both of them are isolated from the surrounding, they are not interacting with each other, right? So the system two is not part of the surrounding of system one. Okay, nevertheless. So moving on to discuss about the third dimension. So so far we talked about system and surrounding. So what separates the system and the surrounding is considered a wall. Or in the other way to put it, we see this example together, right? So if we look at this milk in the box, and then the box is the wall that's separating the system, which is the milk in the box, with its surrounding. As we can see here, there are different kind of words we use to describe the wall. So in this case, we have well three different pairs of Um, well, three different pairs that tells you what kind of wall it is. So here is a more illustrated example. First one, depending on whether or not the wall can move, that's rigid versus non-rigid. So a rigid wall is not going to be able to move. Well, it is a wall. It's like rigid. It stays there, and a non-rigid wall means it can move. Between um well, it can move or change its position. The second dimension is permeable or impermeable. So remember what we were talking about, right? So if you have a permeable wall, it allows no matter to pass through, and well, it, if you have a permeable wall, it allows matter to pass through, and if you have an impermeable wall, it does not allow matter to pass through. So linking this back to our definition of open and closed system, so a permeable wall will tend to lead to a open system, while a impermeable wall will lead to a closed system. Again, open and closed only tells you whether or not、um, the wall allows matter to pass through. 
The third dimension we care about is adiabatic versus non-adiabatic. So an adiabatic wall tells you the wall does not conduct heat. And a non-adiabatic wall tells you the wall will conduct heat. Now let's raise a question here. What kind of wall is needed if we want a isolated system? Now, if you think about it, well, rigid and non-rigid, this is irrelevant when we talk about isolated system, right? An isolated system means we doesn't have a mass transfer. Um, we doesn't allow matter transfer or material transfer. And also, no energy transfer. So naturally, the wall we need for creating an isolated system is going to be an impermeable and adiabatic. Um, actually, rigid is also going to play a role because it... Um, involves like kinetic energy related related property for the isolated system so but nevertheless the impermeable and adiabatic are the more important criteria uh, when we are talking about an isolated system okay next up when we talk about we we now have talked about system uh, surroundings and also the barrier or the wall separating the system and the surrounding. We're now ready to move to talk about equilibrium. So you all learn equilibrium in your general chemistry classes, um, but typically in the previous cases, uh, we were focusing on like material equilibrium or chemical equilibrium. But in thermodynamic terms, we have more um, specific criteria to talk about equilibrium of a non-isolated system. All right, so we only care about non-isolated system when we're talking about the term equilibrium. So in this case, when we talk about equilibrium, effectively what we are saying is the system's macroscopic properties. That includes pressure, volume, temperature, um, number of moles, etc. So these will remain constant with time. All right, so when we're talking about the system's macroscopic properties, like a sing the movement of a single water molecule, that's not a macroscopic property. The, uh, the second criteria would be removal of the system from contact with its surroundings cause no change in the properties of the system. So this means like, say I have a, um, well, like a birthday cake, right? The birthday cake itself is at equilibrium. Now everything in that birthday cake is remaining the same. Nothing is changing. And now I'm just like, um, all of a sudden, add a adiabatic, rigid, and also impermeable wall outside the cake. It's not going to change anything just because we added or we removed that system from contact of its surrounding. So this is a little bit more jargon-like. You have to think a little bit more in like what this criteria comes from. Now, the first one is more straightforward to understand. We'll talk more when we talk about chemical equilibrium in, um, in our later chapters. Next topic is, well, kind of equilibrium. So in this section, we have three different kinds of equilibrium we care about. From the physics point of view, typically we care about mechanical equilibrium, right? If you, uh, you throw a stone, into the air, the stone is going to fall back onto the ground, right? So as long as the system has no acceleration, we consider the system 
is at mechanical equilibrium. And then we have the material equilibrium. So in the material equilibrium, there are two different types of material equilibrium. You can either have a chemical reaction going on or you can have transfer of matter. So in your previous Gen Chem classes, typically we discuss about chemical um, equilibrium or material equilibrium. And in this class, in the, at least in the first part of our class, we will be focusing on thermal equilibrium. So what does thermal equilibrium mean? It says like adding a non-adiabatic wall will cause no change to the system. All right, a non-adiabatic, a thermally conducting wall will cause no change to the system. And in addition, while well, we're talking about thermodynamic equilibrium, what we are saying is all three must be true. So we're saying a, thermo a system that is at thermodynamic equilibrium must be at mechanical equilibrium, material equilibrium, and thermal equilibrium. All right, so some quick example here, right? We've seen this example together in class. Now, assuming we have this, this box of milk, which is, well, has wall of rigid, impermeable, and non-adiabatic. It's a closed system. It allows energy transfer. Now imagine we put this box of milk in the refrigerator and the temperature of the milk and the temperature of the refrigerator is the same. So no heat transfer is taking place. Now inside the fridge, it is at equilibrium. We're happy. And the moment you take it outside of from the fridge and put it in room temperature, which is at 20 degrees Celsius, now we're breaking the equilibrium because eventually the temperature of the milk will raise. So the process uh, violates our first definition, right? So in, in our first criteria of um, equilibrium is seeing the system's macroscopic property will remain constant with time. So we know that the temperature is going to raise, so this is not at equilibrium. Now, if we leave the milk outside the fridge overnight, we say like milk go bad, but the reaction is already at equilibrium. We're manually setting it to material equilibrium. So the temperature now is the same. So it goes back to equilibrium again. All right. Now we talked about system, we talked about surrounding, we talked about walls, we talk, talked about equilibrium, like criteria of equilibrium, different types of equilibrium. And now we're ready to talk, to talk about macroscopic thermodynamic properties. We already saw some of it, right? Like mass, volume, pressure, density, um, number of moles, etc. Um, now the way to put it is when we're talking about these thermodynamic properties, we tend to separate them into two different types. One is extensive, the other is intensive. Now let's read the definition first and then see some example together. Well, we're saying a, um, a thermodynamic property is extensive. It's effectively saying that property is the, um, the, the property will have the value equal to the sum of its value for the parts of the system. This might sound like very jargon-like, but effectively what it says is a bigger system. The extensive property will change when the size of your system becomes bigger or smaller, right? So like mass, volume, number of moles, So these are the property that will change alongside with the sides of your system. In comparison, we have intensive property. So these are, um, well, intensive properties are the value that does not depend on the size of the system. So example would be pressure, density, and something you can think about is concentration. 
right? So if we look at a more straightforward example, now you have like a a box of milk you buy from Whole Food, which is like small, and a huge box of milk you buy from Costco. Now they have different sizes, right? So the mass and volume will be different. Or number of mores. So these are extensive properties. So they will change, right? So a smaller box of milk contains, well, less mass, less volume, less number of mores comparing to the bigger box. But on the other hand, the pressure, meaning like we scale up the box like um, dimensionally, the density of the milk or the concentration of protein, for example. So these are intensive properties. They will remain the same for I milk from a smaller box or milk from a bigger box. All right, so a quick question. So let's say if taste is a macroscopic property. Is it going to be an intensive property or an extensive property? So obviously, if you drink milk from smaller box or big box, as long as it's the same kind of milk, they will stay the same. So if we can define taste as a macroscopic property, then it must be an intensive property. All right, our last thermodynamic terms we want to define is homogeneous versus heterogeneous system. So when we talk about homogeneous system, what we are saying is that an each intensive macroscopic property is constant throughout a system. Right, so if you think about it, when we're saying intensive macroscopic property, again, we have like density, we have concentration, um, pressure, etc. So this intensive property will stay the same throughout the system. And the homogeneous part of a system is considered a phase. Now let's imagine we have a cup of water. What it says is like if I take a droplet from the top part, of the water or the bottom part or anywhere in this cup, right? So the density of the water or the concentration or, well, in this case, if it is pure water, then that's one, or um, pressure will stay the same inside the cup because this is a homogeneous system. But alternatively, like say, if we have a cup of water and on the top we have oil right so now if i take a droplet from the top part and the bottom part they will have different density different well concentration for water and etc so this will become a heterogeneous system And in heterogeneous system, we have two phase, a oil phase and a water phase. So a bit more example here. These are the things we saw in class. Um, just think about it. Which one, uh, how many phases are there and whether or not it is a homogeneous or heterogeneous system? You can find the answer to this question on our annotated note. All right. Next up, we spend some time talking about differential calculus or review of differential calculus. Now, before we start, I just want to clarify one thing that this is not a math class, right? Obviously, I'm not going to go over um, everything you learned in calculus. Rather, this class is going to be an application of both differential calculus and integral calculus you learned in your math class. So we will be focusing more in how to use calculus as a tool to study for science 
or in this case, physical chemistry. So in differential calculus, I'm going to very quickly go over some of the terms you learned. So this is a refresh of your calculus memory. Say we have function, right? What does function mean? So in this case, whenever we have y, we write it as a parenthesis x. We're saying y is a function of variable x. We will talk about Boyle's law and Charles' law on our Wednesday lecture. So in this case, um, if we write it out, you can write them as functions. Like Boyle's law tells you the product of pressure and volume always equals to constant some constant k at constant temperature and mass, right? So if we write p as a function of volume, then we can write it as k over v. Or we can write v as a function of pressure or volume as a function of pressure that equals to k over P. And this cons at constant TP must hold true for both of them. Likewise, we have the Charles law, right? You have volume being a linear function of temperature at constant pressure and mass. Right, so in this case, what we're saying is volume is a linear function of temperature. And in here, our A1 is the intercept. Our A2 is the slope. And then we brief touched on the limit. Uh, we want to use limit very extensively in our class, but it's good to know, right? If we write something like this, it tells you the, the this equation basically says the limit of the function sine x over x when x approaches 0 is equal to 1. Now, your x can never be 0 because it's on the bottom, but um, we can talk about the limit of this function. All right. And then derivatives, right? So these are the definition of derivatives. Like, you, what, what does it mean by writing y prime? That's the first derivative. y double prime, that's the second derivative. And then we write dy equals to y prime, or the derivative of y as a function of x dx. Or you can write dy over dx equals to y prime x. We went over the chain rule, which helps to solve more complicated differential equations. Like, for example, if you were to ask to solve for the, uh, the differential equation of sine 3r squared, but checking the, the list of common formula for differentials, we do not have a formula for sine 3r squared. So we can simplify this problem by manually set z equals to sine 3r squared and x equals to um, 3r squared. And you can work on this um, yourself and check your answer with our annotated note. Then we have common formulas for differentials, right? So these are the formulas that we will be using in this quarter. Again, um, as, say, as stated in the syllabus, I do not expect you to remember all these differential equations. I mean, I'm not your math teacher, but I highly recommend you review your calculus, especially the application of these equations, because we will be using them in, the, in your homework and also your um, exams. All right, so an open book exam doesn't mean you can study during the exam. It only means like you need to know where to find it and you don't have to do like rigid memorization. All right, so the last bit we covered is partial derivatives. So in thermodynamics, more typically, like if you think about the ideal gas law, right? So PV equals to NRT. Or if you write P or pressure as a function of volume and temperature, right? You can write that as P equals to NRT over V or versa.
by volume as a function of P and T, temperature as a function of P and V. So in this case, what it means is a function can have two or more variables, right? So zxy is an example, and pvt is also an example. So when we're talking about the change of pressure, when we have multiple variables, we use partial derivatives. So we write it as this new symbol, and this tells you this is a partial derivative of v with respect to x at constant y. All right, or the other way to put it, we're, we're talking about the changing of y is approaching zero. That's a constant y. So if we look at an example here, right, we have z equals to x squared y third plus um, exponential of yx. When we're looking at the total differential of this z, which is a function of both x and y, we have two different partial derivatives to consider. One is the partial derivative of z as of z with respect to x at constant y, and partial derivative of z with respect to y at constant x. Now in this example, if we write it out, what we're saying is well when taking these partial derivatives, we're treating the other variable as a constant. So in this case, treating y as a constant gives us like y to the third. I'm just writing the constant out. And then 2x plus, well, yx, we're just taking y out. And the e to the x stays the same. Right, so the partial derivative of z with respect to x at constant y is equal to y to the third, 2x plus y times exponential of yx. Likewise, we can do the same for partial derivative of z with respect to y at constant x. So now we're keeping x a constant and 3y squared plus x exponential yx. Right, so the total differential of your zxy is dz, and we put this one here, y to the third, 2x plus y e to the yx dx plus this one. Well, let me change a different color. x squared, 3y squared plus x e to the yx dy. All right, you want to keep the dx and dy in here. You cannot just ignore it. And as a final conclude, um, there are three different relationships of these partial derivatives that we highly um, care about. So in thermodynamics, again, we talk about relationship of different macroscopic properties. Like when we're talking about PV equals NRT, right, we're talking about the relationship of these macroscopic pressure, volume, number of mole, and temperature, etc. So the relative relation between these variables in our thermodynamic laws largely go back to the relationship of these partial derivatives. So we will be using these partial derivatives on a routine base in this lecture. So I highly recommend you go back and review chapter 1.6, especially these three equations because we will be using them later this quarter. I have also left two sample questions, 1.42 and 1.45. So these are your chapter N problems. There are very good references for you to use um, in this chapter. So you can work on it yourself. And I also posted the answer to these sample questions in our annotated note. All right, well, this is the end of this recording. I guess good luck with your study, and I wish you successful in Chem 110. And I'll see you on Wednesday, which is tomorrow.